Desert Shield, Desert Storm in 90 to 91. Uh, I did a deployment, which was to a combat theater, but didn't result in conflict for Operation Southern Watch slash Intrinsic Action in 1992. And I did uh, two tours in Operation Iraqi Freedom from 2005 to 2006 and 2007 to 2008. What was your branch of service? Uh, United States Army. And what was your highest rank? I retired as a colonel of infantry. And then how did you get into the service? Uh, I used to tell folks that I served three tours at Fort Campbell, Kentucky before I even reached the age of 10. Uh, <laughs> I was born a screaming eagle, literally. My father was in the service um, and was actually in his, uh, the twilight of his military career. I was, I was a late baby in the family. Uh, so in 1965, as my dad was preparing to go to Vietnam, uh, I was born in the hospital at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Um, and, uh, and as I joked, I served there. Uh, three more times. We, we moved, we moved uh, away and back again to Fort Campbell three times between 1965 and 1975. I was born there. Uh, my dad went to Vietnam. In those days, families were not allowed to stay in government quarters, so we actually returned to home base here in Connecticut, lived right on Fielding Terrace right over here, where I ended up living later to go to high school and everything. Um, <clears throat> Returned back to Fort Campbell for a couple of more years. Uh, Dad went to Vietnam again, came back home again, uh, and then went back to Fort Campbell one more time for five years before my dad retired and we moved back here. So the way I got into the service is I was born into the service. I was born into the United States Army. I used to joke, I still joke with people to this day, and, and, and for anyone out there who served in the U.S. Army Band, this is no hit on you, but... Uh, we lived in a duplex. My dad was a non-commissioned officer. He was a, he was a sergeant, sergeant first class. And, uh, and we had a warrant officer that lived next door to us in our duplex. And, and he was the, he was the uh, band master. He was the leader of the band. My dad was a paratrooper. So we'd be out on the front lawn, me and the kids next door playing. And their dad, and I'm not making this up, their dad would be practicing his drum major stuff. And I would be able to point to Friar Drop Zone on Fort Campbell, Kentucky and say, that's my dad, jumper number 12, right there. Because you could see, from our front yard, you could see the C-130s flying over Friar Drop Zone doing the, doing the sustainment jumps that, the, that they would do. So that's a long way of saying I was born into the Army. It was probably, you know, my destiny that I was going to end up joining. Did you want to be a soldier since you were a kid? I, I don't think I can make that claim. Um, there was a little bit of a prompt from my from my old man at a certain point in my young life. Um, so after he retired in 1975, uh, and you know, as we go along in this story, the the, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, right? He was uh, he was a three war vet. He when when he was a young man, uh, he lived up on Roth Street here in Norwich, Connecticut. And, you know, as, as he would tell the story, it was, uh, it was a, a few different diasporas, right? There was the Italian bunch of kids, there was the Irish bunch of kids, there was a Polish bunch of kids, and they'd all play and fight in the neighborhood and everything. He was, uh, I don't know, sophomore at Norwich Free Academy, uh, and, you know, World War II broke out, and him and a bunch of his buddies said, let's go do this thing, lied about his age, which... That story is repeated for that era of, of our, of our uh, history. 16 years old, lied about his age. Next thing you know, he's, he's one of uh, America's first paratroopers. He was in the 513th Parachute Infantry Regiment in World War II. As a young mortarman, jumped over the Rhine in Operation Varsity, the largest Allied airborne operation of World War II. Got out of the Army, came back to Norwich, didn't like the civilian gig, got back in the Army, served in Korea with the 187th Regimental Combat Team, uh, got out, didn't like the civilian gig, got back in the Army again, 
uh, served a few tours in Vietnam with the 101st Airborne Division, uh, the 10th Special Forces Group, and with USAID when they were first getting going in their uh, intergovernmental things with uh, nation building in Vietnam. So that that all of that is is you know is part of the answer about why I served and all those other kinds of things. When he finally retired in 1975, it was because he had been promoted to E8 and they had a first sergeant job for him in Germany. I had two brothers in high school. One was a uh, probably a sophomore and the other was a junior. And they were going to Fort Campbell High School, which is there's at that time, and I think even still today, there's only two DOD high schools on base, Fort Knox and Fort Campbell. And he made the decision, look, I've been doing this Army thing cumulatively for 26 years now. I'm not uprooting my family and going to Germany to chase this first sergeant job. I'm done. And he retired. Uh, served out his time in the division headquarters so my brothers could both graduate from high school. And then we moved home here to Connecticut. And there's a reason I tell that whole story, because years down the road, my thinking kind of ended up going down the same path. At any rate, uh, so we got back here to Connecticut, uh, home, home on the reservation, frankly. My mother is Native American, Mohegan. Uh, back to Fielding Terrace, where we had lived transiently in years past. Now we have a home at this point in 1975 on Fielding Terrace. Uh, 10 or 12 tribal families living on the road. It was the, it was the mini reservation before federal recognition. Junior high school and high school here. And so now it's the time to really answer your question. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a fairly decent athlete, but I'm not a, I'm not a blue chip Heisman trophy kind of guy. Nobody's coming knocking my door down. Um, and so I'm looking around New England at schools and the Army football coach pays a visit. And I get a call to go to the guidance counselor's office and talk to the Army football coach. Well, that's pretty cool, right? It's pretty cool because it's it's Division I football, and I got called, called out of class for it, but I'm an Army family, so it, it makes a lot of sense for me. Uh, I tell my dad about it. The next thing I know, one day he walks into the kitchen, you know, Ray's Ranch, humble home, kitchen table, the kind you'd buy at uh, what was Caldor's back in the day with the folding leafs, right? Fold them down, fold them up. It's as big as this. He drops the West Point application packet on that table and the whole table shakes. He says, fill that out. Kind of end of story. <laughs> Filled it out. Uh, we took a trip, he and I, up to West Point on a cold February winter day. I'll never forget it. Because if you were trying to recruit a young man or woman to go to your college, the last thing you'd want them to do if you were at West Point is have them come on a cold February day off the Hudson where the wind is blowing down and everything's gray and bleak. <clears throat> and for whatever reason, and I guess the rest of my life maybe is, you know, the proof of it, as we drove away from West Point after that couple of day visit, we were going up 9W on the banks of the Hudson, and I looked back down, and I looked at my dad, I said, that's where I want to go to school. I was 17 years old, and I think I just knew that, you know, being an athlete, being in an Army family, the team, the camaraderie, the service, the purpose, the duty on our country, all those things really resonated, and uh, now, so I chose to go to West Point. This time? I was in my senior year at this time, yes, yes. So that was that. The following year, you went to West Point? So that, that year was not a good winter for Connecticut if, if you were a school teacher because there were a lot of snow days. And, and I've told this story a hundred times, too. What year was that? Uh, it, was 80, it was 83 that I graduated from high school. And uh, we had piled up so many snow days that my high school graduation, plus or minus a day, was on something like the, it was on a Sunday, something like the 27th of June. And the day that you had to report into West Point was the 1st of July. So my summer break was three days long. Three days long with one of those days being a travel day to get up to West Point. And so 1st of July, 1983, uh, I was at what is called our day, reception day, 
uh, of Beast Barracks at the United States Military Academy. Technically, I guess you'd say that's when your service began. Yeah. Can you give me some highlights from your years at West Point? And how <laughs> they groomed you for your future? Uh, well, uh, within four hours, they have taken you from being a civilian to having your head shaved, shine shoes on your feet, learning how to stand at attention, march and salute, and you're in your first parade at two that afternoon as your parents watch you parade off into the barracks and that's it. <clears throat> I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you, I'll give you a story of that, that very day. And then I'll try not to go day by day over the next four years. <laughs> the way they, the way they separate you from your family is you're all in the bleachers at Mikey stadium, the football stadium. And, uh, a man in the red sash, you know, cadet uniform with the red sash on and his saber comes up and says, all right, ladies and gentlemen, at this time, you will say goodbye uh, to your new cadet and they will meet me down on the, on the football field. So you turn and, you know, everyone's crying and, you know, separate. And my old man, you know, non-commissioned officer, all right, uh, he, he, he and or my mom had cut out a little clip out of one of the West Point uh, collateral magazines we had gotten and it said, you just have to keep a sense of humor. So he handed me that. He said, put this in your pocket. And then he said to me, kid, when I was your age, I was descending on the far side of the Rhine River and German tracers were going through my parachute silk. In a couple of hours, some kid that's 19 years old is going to be yelling at you about a scuff mark on your shiny shoe. You're going to be okay. And it really calibrated my expectations, my resilience, my ability to get through it and realize that it, the world's not going to come crashing down. There's nothing that's about to happen that's going to make my world come crashing down. And, uh, you know, you don't really learn those things till you reflect on them. And, and, but boy, am I, am I happy that my, that I had the dad that I had who kind of, you know, helped frame my expectations about a lot of things, uh, in life and certainly in the service. So that was day one. You want to hear about day two? Sure. <laughs> so eight weeks of beast bar what they call beast barracks, basic training. You know, learn how to crawl in the mud and shoot a rifle. And, and uh, uh, yeah, I got too many stories. So here's a story. So, this might end up being a two-part. So, so, so uh, you know, a bunch of stories from beast barracks. But the bottom line is I survived it, right? Um, but, but one funny story. You know, again, West Point is full of accomplished kids, a bunch of high school seniors who were all, you know, at the top of their class and athletes and, you know, involved in the community. Everybody's the same cut. So now all of a sudden, you're not that guy anymore. You're just one of a bunch. And, and I thought, you know, for the most part, this is going to be a breeze. I'm in shape. I came from a military family. I know what to expect. Like, I got this. I got this. I can do this. So we go to the rifle range, and it's the first chance we have to prove our mettle with a, with a rifle. And, and even though I came from a military family, I didn't grow up hunting and, and doing all those kinds of things. So I didn't have, you know, maybe the, the handle on it, but, but I wasn't scared about it. And I was like, I can do this. So I'm on the rifle range, and it's hot. It's 100 degrees, and, you know, the sun's beating down on your rifle and on you, and you're sweating, and it's your first time with a, with a weapon. And all they want you to do is zero your rifle. Make sure that it hits where you're aiming. Three rounds, boom, boom, boom. And if they're close, then you're good. Three more rounds to confirm it. Three more rounds just to make double sure. And you're off the range. Now you're going to go qualify. I could not zero my rifle. And, and, and you know, at first go, it was like, yeah, okay, it's happened. It's happening to a lot of people. It's new. No big deal. I became about the very last person in my company my, to, to zero my rifle. And I'm thinking, oh man, this is not the route. I thought this was all going to go. Well, here's what happened. Uh, the way that they conduct summer training at West Point is they bring an active duty, active duty unit in uh, to train the young cadets. Back in those days, it was always either the 82nd Airborne Division or the 101st Airborne Division. It was the 101st. It was my Screaming Eagles. I mean, my comfort level was there. You know, I got this. These are my people. <laughs> and, uh, 
and uh, and they're they're watching me shooting. Like, what is wrong with this kid? So you know, I don't know exactly how it went down, but you know, someone in that unit from the 101st, you know, was you know Smitty. Hey, Smitty, get down there and shoot that kid's rifle. He couldn't hit the paper. They took me off the range. They took me to the weaponier. They rotted my rifle. They put me on a diagnostic thing. They found out the barrel was bent. <laughs> so, so you'd think that's the end of the story because, you know, okay, got me a new rifle with a straight barrel. I zeroed, I qualified, which is all good, but here's what happened. <clears throat> the way we drew our rifles from the arms room was alphabetical. So at Brown, I was able to draw one of the first rifles, which meant whenever we came back off the range or back out of training, I was one of the first ones to turn my rifle in, which bought me a precious five or eight minutes that I could sit down, shine a shoe, drink some water, maybe even take a fast shower before the R's and W's and Z's were turning in their rifles, which was great. But in all the times that I toted that rifle around and never actually had to shoot it till I had to shoot it, you know, that was great. Now that I've fired it, I've had to trade it out. I now have the last rifle drawn in the company. I'm the last one every time we got to turn in our rifles to turn in his rifle. So by the time I get back to my room, everybody else is already coming back downstairs for the next formation. So the next four weeks of basic training, I felt like I was running to catch up for everything. There's a story for you from, from cadet basic training. So you transition from that, you, uh, you uh, begin the academic year. Uh, with a 12-mile road march back from Lake Frederick uh, training area. And the upperclassmen are all there waiting on you. And, and whereas in the summer, as scared as you were as a new cadet, because it's all brand new, at least the ratio during the summer is four new cadets to every one senior cadet. Now that you're back in the academic, it's reversed. There's three of them for every one of you. There's sophomores, juniors, and seniors and so there's people in your face all the time for whatever reason. Uh, so that was an adjustment. No big deal, really. Um, and the academic year starts and then you're going to college. But you're going to college under the conditions of a military academy. Which means you're making formations, you're shining your shoes, you're doing extra duties and delivering laundry and mail and calling minutes uh, to make sure that everyone else makes it to the formation on time. Um, so it was, it was, uh, it was quite an experience. And, and what I can tell you that, that I often reflect on from that is I was assigned to company I four there, there, I, I honestly don't know how they've reorganized the core. Now it's a little bit different today. I think it may only be a company through H company in each of the four regiments, but at that time it was a through I in four regiments. So I was literally, now, remember my, my rifle example, last rifle in the arms room? I was literally in the last company of the Corps. So when we would march onto the parade field and stand at attention for however many minutes, you know, 50-gun salute to the nation on 4th of July, when it came time to step off and start marching, A1, A then B1. And I4 would be at attention for 27 minutes before it actually could move its body. And by that time, A1 is already back in the barracks and cleaned up and on to the next thing. So I drew the short straw on that one as well. The other thing that that did is it, it made it interesting getting to class because where our company was, we were in the oldest cadet barracks uh, that were still in existence at the time. So I had the longest path to get to my classes every day and back again. I, I can tell you stories for days. But anyway, um, and it was an adjustment. It was an adjustment. Like I said, you know, I was a, I was a good student. I wasn't number one in my class, but I was a good student. Learning was easy. Uh, learning was hard all of a sudden, just like every other freshman, right? It's that adjustment period, but you got people yelling at you and you got this going on you got that going on in my first semester. Um, I took swimming. I was what they called a rock squad swimmer. I was not a good swimmer. That's a whole story in and of itself. So remedial swimming was going on. My dog died back home. My dad got throat cancer, was diagnosed with throat cancer. And, and I was 
not getting the kinds of grades that I was accustomed to. And on the football landscape, even though I was recruited, I wasn't getting any playing time and I was questioning, what am I doing here? You know, and, uh, uh, the story that I like to tell about that one is I was, I was on my way back from a class. It was, you know, a cold, probably November winter day, my first semester as a plebe. Beanheads is what they called us, beanheads, because fourth class or brand new cadets weren't real adept at wearing their service cap the right way. They pull them down a little too tight. And so the top of it, you know, that nice flat saucer, a little bit would stick out like, be like beanhead. Anyway, there were a number of other things they would call us then too. Uh, I was on my way back and uh, I just was feeling really low because of all these things that I just described to you. So I dropped down into the basement of our barracks where there was one of those old wooden phone booths with the payphone, and I called home and I, I didn't do that. I didn't, I didn't just out of the blue, you know, call home. It's just not what I did. So I think my mom knew when she answered the phone, what's going on now. My dad was the Sergeant, uh, in the army, but growing up, my mom was every bit the drill Sergeant, uh, she would literally, and, and not to be uh, militaristic about it, but just to be sort of comical about it, she would stand in my doorway on a school morning and she would blow Reveille through her hand. She'd do that. And, you know, she'd say to me, hey, stand up straight, stick your chest out, throw your shoulders back. That, that, that's what you'd get from her. Hey, you better toughen up, you know, and give you a little, give you a little, you know, you better toughen up. So she was, she was every bit the, the motivator that my dad was. Um, so when I called her that day and I said, I said, hello, she's, Hey, how you doing? And I'm okay. She said, you don't sound very good. And it was, the, I, I convinced to this day, I don't know that I ever really talked to her about this. I, I know I told her this story to me, it felt like reverse psychology. Because she said to me at that point, is it too hard? Do you want to come home? Nope. <laughs> I was, I was fixed right then and there. <laughs> said, no, nah, I'm okay. I'm, I'm going to be fine. Hung up the phone and made Dean's list the next semester and transitioned from playing army football to playing army rugby. And, you know, things kind of turned around from that point forward. Three years at West Point. Um, I was a cadet company commander when I was a senior, uh, for that same summer that I had been a plebe in. So I was, you know, I was in charge of 140 new cadets myself when I was a senior to bring things full circle. It was, that was a great, that was a great experience. And, uh, in those last couple of years at West Point, I made the decision that, uh, I was, I was going to be an infantryman. I was going to join the army to join the army, uh, and, and be a ground soldier, uh, and a lot of different things during my experience at West Point led that, you know, exposure to instructors and, and their character and where it looked like they came from and the things that they did. That's really what led uh, a lot of that discussion. And then my dad's own experiences, you know, as an 11 Charlie Mortarman in World War II, I mean, you know, you see a, when you see a combat infantryman's badge in a, in a shadow box in your house growing up, whether you think about it or not, it puts in, it imprints your, your psyche. Uh, and there was no way I wasn't going to do that. So that senior year came, I chose infantry. Um, my dad was trying to convince me to go military intelligence the whole time. And then when I said, dad, I chose infantry, he said, good. And, uh, and then the next thing that I had to do was choose my post. And, and this is, these are, these are big deals at West Point, uh, the, branch night and, and post night are big deals when everyone learns what they're going to be and where they're going to go. You don't necessarily get what you choose. You don't necessarily get what you choose. And, uh, and, and when it comes to your branch, uh, if you're la it goes by order of your, your class rank. So when it comes to choosing, you could get what they called branched. You, you got what was left. For whatever reason, the years that I was there, artillery was, was the branch that was sort of left over that people got, here, this is what you're going to do. Um, 
And then the same thing with the installations. And it's funny because uh, my dad served in, in uh, you know, today the 82nd Airborne Division and the Ranger Regiment are really all you think of when you think about who's a paratrooper in our army today. And a brigade in Italy and a brigade in Alaska, which is a little bit of growth over the last decade. But all of those airborne divisions we had back in yesteryear are, are just patches on a wall now. Um, my dad served in every airborne uh, organization in our army except for the 82nd Airborne Division, the All-American Division. Everybody's, you know, on parade division for our United States Army. He served in the 11th Airborne Division, the 187th Regimental Combat Team, the 101st, the 513th PIR, which was part of the 17th Airbo 13th Airborne Division, but then got moved over to the 17th Airborne Division. He served in the Special Forces. He'd been all around the airborne community. When it came time for me to pick my post, and, and this, for anyone who watches or hears or listens to this, this might anger some folks down the road. But he said to me, he said, let me tell you something. The 82nd Airborne Division is all show and no go. <laughs> so, you know, it, it did, I was probably a junior at West Point when he said that to me. Didn't really register except, huh. You know, oh, that's interesting. So now I'm a senior, um, and the way they did this process of choosing your installation back in these days, it was with the overhead projector and the acetate thing with a grease pencil and stick figures. So it would say, you know, Vincenza, Italy, and it would have two strict stick figures because there was only two slots in Vincenza, and that was the premier. Everybody wanted that one. Everybody wanted that one. And then there would be Europe, and there'd be 14, you know, and then Fort Bragg, 12, and Fort Campbell, 10, and Hawaii, 7, or whatever. And then it'd all be up there. <clears throat> and for all the infantrymen that piled into Washington Hall on the sixth floor of the mess hall at West Point, New York, uh, above the mess hall that night, Fort Bragg was always a hot item because except for my dad, who thought all show and no go. Everybody, oh yeah, you got to go to the 82nd. That's the place to go. Um, so, you know, after my dismal first semester as a plebe, I did good enough that I moved up a little bit academically. And when it came time, I had the opportunity to grab the last spot to the 82nd Airborne Division as we did. And the way it happens is you literally, you stand, there's, I guess probably 190 of us went infantry out of my class of, of 1,050 that graduated. We started with 1,400 cadets in our class. And, and reflecting back to that R day, they tell you, they say, look to your left and right. One of you is going to be gone by the time the fourth year hits. And the attrition rate at West Point is about 33%. So our class started with 1440, we ended with 1058, which was a pretty good, pretty good uh, metric, I guess. And of those, about 190 or 200 of us, I think, probably went infantry. So now you got the 200 of us all piled in there, and one at a time, by class rank, you stood up, you said your post, you sat back down, they exit off the sheet. You watched the sheet, you <laughs> kept track, and you knew when it came to be your time, you were going to stand up and say where you were going and sit back down. So... We're here we go, we're proceeding, Fort Bragg still left, Fort Bragg still left, Fort Bragg still left. Everyone's watching. Got a bunch of my buddies are sitting around me. It's my turn. And they all know. There's one left at 80. They're like, oh man, he's gonna take it. We've got to start looking at other stuff. I stood up with the intent to say the 82nd Airborne Division, because I wanted that cool patch on my sleeve. I stood up, I said, Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and I sat back down, and everybody was like, what did you just do? <laughs> and so uh, I said, I think I just did what my dad wanted me to do. <laughs> and so the, the cool thing about this story is my first active duty assignment in the Army was with the 101st Airborne Division at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, where I was born, which, you know, pretty cool, pretty cool. Pretty cool, yeah. So after that, you have your your you branch, you have your post, you graduate. Mm -hmm. Do you immediately go to to your duty station, or do you get any time off? You get the summer off? Yeah, the uh, the typical 
uh, timeline is you are lined up for an officer basic course sometime later that summer and you get 30 days of leave. So, um, <laughs> I have a story about my graduation day. <laughs> All right, so here we are. Uh, it's the 27th of May, 1987. And uh, we've all got our, you know, well, not all of us, but, you know, there's the tradition you put the silver dollar inside your white glove and the first enlisted man that you salute or that salutes you, you actually get to return your first salute as an officer and you give him that silver dollar. Um, so that was my dad. Now he was retired, right? But so, you know, we had our moment. And, and then he says to me, you know, and I get pinned. I, I go through the commissioning ceremony where I put my, actually put my greens on for the first time. And my mom and my dad pinned my gold butter bars on my epaulets. We ate cake, we drank punch. And then I had to go pack my room up and go home. So for a lot of families, and this is not to take anything away from them, but we all come from different places, right? I came from an army family. I came from an army family where my dad was a non-commissioned officer, you know, a salty, crusty NCO. Some of these families who are visiting West Point are experiencing the military for the first time in their lives. And my son's an officer. and This is brilliant. And not, you know, I mean, people are coming from Alaska and California and Texas. But for my family, it was 139 miles from Uncasville, Connecticut in the Chevy Vega to West Point, New York, where my dad, as a, as a crusty old NCO, could give a damn about a lieutenant. He's proud of me, but I'm just another lieutenant to him, right? So we're all done with the, with the, the heyday of, of graduation at West Point, and my dad looks at me and says, all right, kid, I'm going to go home and cut the grass. I'll see you in a few hours. <laughs> and he leaves. And... Uh, <laughs> And this is where I might get profane. I don't know. I'll, you know, screen or whatever. Um, so he goes, I pack my car and, uh, I roll up cause it's, I mean, it's 139. We drove it enough times, right? It's 139.2 miles or whatever. So three hours and some change later, I pull up in the front yard right over here, Fielding Terrace, gravel driveway, raised ranch house, nothing special. And, uh, uh, and, you know, at the end of the sidewalk, there's a lamp post and it's got a little hanging thing on it. And it's, it's a master blaster, master parachutist wings that my mom painted with his gold combat star for having conducted a combat jump in World War II, right? So I'm, I drive up and park next to that and I'm all full of myself because I'm, I'm a lieutenant now and I just graduated from West Point. And I pull up and no kidding, he's finishing a butt. <sighs> At the end of the sidewalk, in his Budweiser cap and his cut-off jeans and his Corfram shoes, because that's what he wore when he cut the grass. I don't know why. Um, and uh, I've got this, you know, brand new sports car because every West Point graduate thinks he has to buy himself a sports car, and it's full of a bunch of stuff that I probably don't really need, you know, big stereo equipment and everything else. So I pull up and I'm I'm pretty full of myself, and I'll never forget it. He puts his cigarette out at the end of the sidewalk, looks at me and says, fucking lieutenant. <laughs> and walks in the house. And I'm like, well, damn. So I go inside and he's laughing. And he says, let me tell you something, kid. He said, right now, and this is in the late 80s. He's, and so I think the number was 800,000. I think our active duty army was about 800,000 at that time. It's now 490 or something. He said, let me tell you something. Right now, there are 800,000 Muldoons in the United States Army, and you're just one of them. If you were to take a half step to the right in that formation, guess what's going to happen? The other 799,999 are going to keep marching along. Don't ever get too full of yourself. Never forgot that the rest of my military career. And, 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 and he, he taught me a ton in that moment. He taught me a ton in that moment. And we all make that mistake in our lives sometimes, especially in a, you know, in a, uh, uh, 
what's it called? You know, the environment, just the dog eat dog environment of, of being an officer in the army and people crawling all over each other to get promoted and be the best and all that other kind of stuff. But if and when I ever made the mistake of falling into that, it was it didn't take me long to remember that lecture I got that first day when I graduated from my dad. Just just those things that you didn't learn in the moment that boy you learned them as life went on. So that was that. And then on my 30 days of leave post West Point, I think it was the next morning or two days late, it wasn't long after. Apparently, my dad wasn't going to have me just lounging around his house. <laughs> so he says to me, my brother was uh, at the time active duty uh, and in Germany, in Baumholder, in Eder Oberstein, uh, outside of Baumholder, in the 8th Infantry Division at the time. So I, I wake up one morning and he's on the phone and he's working the phone because that's, that's how he was. And he's figured it all out. He says to me, hey, pack your bags. We're going to Europe. <laughs> okay. Well, I can't just go to Europe. I don't have I don't have a leave form that says I can go to Europe. He says, "Okay, well, this is what you're going to do." And he tells call the adjutant at West Point cuz he knows all this stuff. I don't know. I'm a lieutenant. I don't know all this stuff. And within the next, I don't know, 24 to 48 hours, we were at Pease Air Force Base catching a Mac flight, Military Airlift Command Mac flight, which is space available. If there's a plane flying across the ocean to Europe, and there's room after all the cargo has been put on it, then you can get on and pay, I don't know, six bucks for a box lunch, and that's your airfare. And so we mapped, it, 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 the parlance is, we mapped to Europe to visit my brother. Flew into Mildenhall, England, transferred planes, flew into, uh, gosh, I can't remember what air base, Ramstein, in Germany. And my brother picked us up, and we spent a week in Germany with my brother. Uh, and then we macked our way back. Um, <laughs> and you know, he just, he kind of, he just taught me to be agile and, you know, just again, things that you don't think about till you think about them. Um, the great part of that story is he and I were two different categories of traveler. I, I think there's like seven different categories that you get put in on active duty, on emergency leave gets the first seat. On active duty, on regular leave, gets the second seat. Uh, on active duty, on on orders, probably gets the, you know all the way down to retiree. And my dad now he's a retiree, and I'm active duty. So we made it into England. We missed out on getting seats on the first two or three planes. We literally just laid up in the airport for a few hours or a day, and then the opportunity comes for me to get a seat and leave him behind. <laughs> well, he's a little more adept at this thing. I left Mildenhall before him, but he got home before me. And don't you think my mom gave him a heavy dose of the what for about leaving her baby behind? And he's like, hey, he's a lieutenant. You know, he's on his own. He's got to figure it out. So that was the leave portion. Uh, and then after that, I signed into Fort Benning, Georgia, home of the infantry. Uh, the land that God forgot, as the cadence says, where the sun is blazing hot, and uh, did all those things that a newly commissioned infantry officer is made to do. Um, I had already gone to airborne school while I was a cadet, so went to the basic course and immediately following, literally the day after, uh, signed into the U.S. Army Ranger School and went to ranger school. All right, so you said you signed up for Army Ranger uh, school. Is that required or is that a volunteer thing? Um, so based on what branch you're commissioned, before you go to your actual first duty assignment, which for me was going to be Fort Campbell, you have to go to your, your branch-specific school. Infantry goes to Fort Benning, quartermaster goes to you know, Fort Lee, etc. When you get to the land of the infantry, the home of the infantry at Fort Benning, Georgia, if you want to be the very best infantryman that you can be, you want to arrive at that first duty station wearing the ranger tab on your left shoulder. So you are not made to go, but you're highly compelled to go. Uh, and, there, and, and there's hardly an infantryman on the planet 
And look, lot, lots of things happen. Good things happen to bad people. Bad things happen to good people. Some people just don't make it because they broke a leg. It's not the measure of the man, uh, but it's at least a, it's a compulsory sort of feeling that you're at least going to walk in the front door to that school and you're going to give it a go. You're going to give it a shot one way or the other. So uh, it was, I guess, July to late October for the basic course. And then the 3rd of November, 1987, we signed in. A bunch of us from that same basic course signed into to Ranger School. Um, you know, there's certain days in your life you'll remember. I remember you do this history thing with a lot of folks, and, and you know how this goes. There are days that you will always remember, and the 3rd of November, 88, was when we signed in. So here's the funny thing about that day. Uh, that made it somewhat memorable. Um, <clears throat> you know, the U.S. Army Ranger School is known as as the, the premier leadership Petri dish. Right? It puts you under stressful condi conditions without sleep <clears throat> in leadership roles and sees what you're made of, what you're metal. And uh, <clears throat> it's also well known that you don't you don't eat a lot of good meals while you're there. So... That morning. How long does Ranger School take? If you if you make it through Ranger School front to back without any injuries or peer evaluations that have you recycled or failures in conducting patrols that have you recycled, it's and it's changed over the years. But I think for us it was fifty eight days <coughs> in in uh, a few different phases. So. Before we began, we all knew that hey, let's let's go, kind of go have the last supper. So, uh, you know, a, a, a good number of us had graduated from West Point together, had ended up in the same basic course together, and were going to the same Ranger School. So, you know, there's a core core element of about ten or fifteen of us that had gotten to know each other, and and non West Point guys as well that had been in our basic course with us, uh, uh, which interestingly. I ran into one of those folks uh, going on 30 years later right here in this building because he's a financial advisor for one of my colleagues here on the Tribal Council. Bizarre. Just bizarre. At any rate, so Jim Marler, you, uh, Connecticut you know, guy, was in my basic course class as an ROTC entrant. And so we were in the same platoon in the basic course and we went off to range school together and then never saw each other again until here. At any rate... That morning, we say, hey, we're going to go to Denny's, and we're going to eat the big boy, super boy breakfast buffet, and we're just going to get full as a tick so that we have no regrets that we didn't at least have a good meal, you know, before we entered the United States Army Ranger School. Well, here's what really happened. We all went out to Denny's, and we were all such a bundle of nerves that we just couldn't do it. <laughs> we couldn't eat it. We were like, yeah, you want to have some more to eat? No, no. We, we probably should go, you know, and, and it was like the wasted moment because later that night we all knew we should have eaten that food because <laughs> we're never getting that back. Uh, Ranger School was, you know, Ranger School was everything that it's cracked up to be and then some. I mean, it really, it took you, it just broke you down, broke you down, uh, I think, I think I dropped about 25 pounds in ranger school. You you have got to be in your very best shape the day you walk in the door to ranger school or you're not going to make it because you're only your 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 health, your fitness, your stamina is only going to degrade from day 1 till the end. So you had you had better be in the very best shape you can be in mentally, physically, all of it. Um and uh and it, and it was challenging, but uh but it was, uh, I could tell you stories for days of, of just certain moments in ranger do school that resonate. Any of your instructors? I do. I remember Sergeant Vega. Vega? <laughs> Sergeant Vega. Okay, tell me about him. Uh, Sergeant Vega was a, was a very large, thickly muscled uh, uh, Sergeant First Class Ranger instructor in the Florida phase of ranger school. Uh, and he was a no nonsense kind of character. He just didn't. He just didn't mess around. And the thing about Ranger School is, you are 
other than a few admin breaks when they pull you out of the field and clean you up or put you on a two hour break or whatever, you're, you're constantly in a tactical environment and, you know, noise and light discipline and packing all your stuff in your rucksack and always looking for the enemy. You're always switched on the whole time. Uh, and you're hardly sleeping. Meanwhile, the ranger instructors, the cadre, for all the right reasons, is, are switching out. So there's a fresh, you know, there's a fresh instructor coming right out of, you know, eating breakfast that morning out to the field. And it's like the, the patrol base catches on fire when those new cadre show up for the morning. And you always knew when Sergeant Vega showed up. And <laughs> never forget one night in Florida, we we got rained on and we walked through the swamp. The Florida phase is conducted down uh, at Eglin Air Force Base in Florida. Um, in the swamps there and, and it was cold in the swamps and it rained and it was just horrible. And, and this is just making me remember all kinds of ranger school stories. But anyway, we, we were drenched. We were absolutely drenched. And at the slightest peak of the sun, Bob, Bob is what, a lot of infantrymen or soldiers will call the sun. Hey, here comes Bob. Bob's coming up over the hill. Bobbed up over the hill. <clears throat> At the slightest indication of Bob, everyone wanted to get their wet stuff out to get it dried out in the in the in the sun. And I think we just sort of had a complete breakdown in our in our field discipline and really our give a damn about having field discipline because we were we were wet rats. So everybody started laying stuff out and stuff was air, stuff was in trees. It was all over the place. And all of that flew in the face of everything we had been getting taught about good field discipline, right? Well, Sergeant Vega shows up and he says, Rangers, this patrol base looks like a Chinese laundry. <laughs> and, and it was a difficult morning. It was a difficult morning because, you know, they... They just make you pack pack up. We're moving. You don't know where you're going. You don't know how long you're going to walk, and you would just walk and walk and walk and walk. And they're did they're you fresh. Stay with the same group of so like how many for, people for the most for the most part. It, the the first part of Ranger School patrols are conducted at the squad size, so seven to ten men. Uh, then in the next phase, so the first phase is the Darby phase, right there at Fort Benning, Georgia. The next phase is the Mountain phase in Dahlonega, Georgia, which is beautiful when you're not a ranger student. I've gone back and hiked the Appalachian Trail up through there. It's beautiful. Um, that's a story for later in life. Um, then you begin to conduct patrols in 14 to 20 man elements. Then you go to the, uh, uh, the Florida phase, mountain, jungle, desert. I skipped desert. Then you go to the desert phase, which at the time was conducted at uh, Dugway Proving Grounds in Utah. High desert, cold as hell. And walking in the sand with 120 pounds on your back in the cold is one of the most miserable things you can do in your life. I'm just here to tell you. <laughs> Was it still the same guys? Though? Same guys. It's just growing, you know, so like the squads were all in the same platoon, but conducting their own patrols. Then two squads from that same platoon would join up and conduct their patrols. And then ultimately you were doing platoon sized operations uh, by the time we hit the Florida phase at the end. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so you were platoon sized when you were hanging up to Chinese lines? Yes, yeah. There was about 30 of us that had our poncho liners, you know, hanging from trees trying to dry them out. And Sergeant Vega wasn't exactly too exact, too too happy about that. I'll tell you another guy I remember from uh, the cadre. Uh, we were in the mountain phase, and um, there was a ranger instructor by the name of Madison, and he was just a crusty, angry mass sergeant. And, you know, there's no, there's no rank uh, and, and hardly a name when you're a ranger school student. You're roster number 88, you know, and you don't wear any rank or any, because you're all the same. So there's, for the most part, the class is full of lieutenants, but there were privates from the ranger battalion. There were sergeants from light infantry units all around the army. Uh, and there were even some captains maybe maybe even a major or two that were trying to earn their ranger tab. 
and there's a few from the Marines, and there's a few from foreign services. And uh, so we're all standing there formation. We're all equals. It doesn't matter. It flat out does not matter what your rank was when you were in the Army a minute ago, because now you're here in range school. You're all the same. And Mass Sergeant Madison is up there on the, on the hillside, uh, and it's mail call. And he get, there's a box, and he's, oh, look here. Looks like, and I don't remember who it was, looks like Ranger, Ranger Dowdy's mom might have sent him some cookies. He shakes the box, he smells it. Yeah, I think those are cookies. Ranger Dowdy, come up here. Ranger Dowdy, rah, what's up? Yes, Sergeant. He says, open this up. He opened it up. Sure enough, there were chocolate chip cookies in. I think it might have had some of that, you know, like the, the oil from it kind of gets on the paper sack on the outside. So he knew. And he says, wow, Ranger Dowdy. Doesn't look like you got enough here for every ranger in this class. So I don't think we should have these. <laughs> Dumps them out on the ground. He says, get back in formation. That was uh, December 1987. Fast forward five years. I'm at Fort Hood, Texas. I'm commanding a mechanized infantry unit in the 1st Cavalry Division. And... Um, getting a new first sergeant to serve as my first sergeant when I'm a company commander. Who walks in? Joe Madison. And he's my first sergeant. <laughs> Just the most amazing thing. Oh, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Because, you know, he cycled so many Ranger students through his unit. But, of course, for me, there was one of him. And, and, and you know, imprinted on my brain forever that moment. Uh, we became lifelong friends. He just passed away uh, a few months ago. One of those guys who embodied the spirit of a hardcore Ranger non-commissioned officer. And I was fortunate enough to have him be my first sergeant when I was an impressionable young company commander. I, it, was, it was one of the best things that could ever happen to me in the Army. And I tell you what. This, this is not something I've ever reflected on before right now. As I talk about my dad, a senior non-commissioned officer and his imprint on me, and as I think about First Sergeant Madison and his imprint on me, and another gentleman that we haven't spoken about yet who was my first platoon sergeant when I was a young lieutenant at Fort Campbell, and his impact on me, I must have been one of the luckiest officers in the United States Army to have had those three guys and a bunch of others be the, be the non-commissioned officers that I was fortunate enough to land because it, it, it's happenstance. There's no design. No one, no one says, for example, you know, Marvin Hill, E6 Staff Sergeant, is going to be Lieutenant Brown's platoon sergeant because we know here today in 1988, that Sergeant, that Staff Sergeant Marvin Hill, 28 years from now, is going to be Command Sergeant Major Marvin Hill, Command Sergeant Major of all forces in Iraq and Afghanistan. But that's who he became. And I got to have him when he was a young Staff Sergeant, and he was my platoon sergeant. I, you know, you just can't. And, it, and it's by happenstance. And there's a great, and, and I'll try to dig it up and provide it, or maybe I'll, if we film again, or maybe you've seen it, but there's a great uh, three-paragraph prose uh, that talks about how lucky we are in the Army that, you know, by happenstance or, or God's divine hand, that we end up with the people wrapped around us that end up wrapped around us. We, we come from all corners of the earth. We don't know each other, and then, boom, we're 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 like old friends and old brothers, and put into the worst of circumstances. It, it's just the, it's one of the cooler things about the army. And it just dawned on me now, talking about Joe Madison, how incredibly lucky I was. I was a lucky man. I was a lucky man. So anyway, those are a couple of characters that I remember from my ranger school days. All right, so you went, did ranger school end at Eglin? Was that your last phase? Yes, uh, last did phase. You, did you just go straight? Through? I went straight through. I can. I. I'm. I'm not. I'm not being proud about it because, like I opened up and told you, lucky is good sometimes. But, 
but I made it through uh, one trip and that doesn't happen a lot. I mean, the recycle rate at Ranger School is probably in the range of 50 plus percent for people who have to go back and do a, an entire phase all over again. Uh, I had one friend that I think recycled about seven times. Yeah, and, 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 if, and if all of us are honest about it, the strange thing is, those of us that were first time goes through Ranger School probably aren't as tough as those guys who did seven recycles and still made it out, you know? Anyway, so yeah, so then I, I graduated in early February. Was there a graduation ceremony? There was, yeah. My dad came down for it, pinned my Ranger tab on my shoulder. Um, <laughs> yeah, and we had another father-son moment. We had another father-son officer, non-commissioned officer moment because... So this must have been February of 88? 88, yeah, yeah. So I, uh, I bought myself a dirt bike during, during the basic course. And uh, you're right on the story. So I bought the dirt bike and I bought it with only about three weeks left in the basic course, knowing full well that I was going to end up having to put it in a U-Haul storage bin for all of Ranger School. I didn't tell my dad that. Uh, but here he is now. He's at Fort Benning, Georgia, and he's going to help me move to Fort Campbell. <laughs> yeah, I still hadn't figured out the whole planning thing that that became that became really who I was as an officer. I mean, you know, I became very good at I became a very good planner, but clearly I still hadn't figured that out at this point because I graduated from Ranger School and, you know, my dad and I drove off post and I think we grabbed a hotel room for the night or something like that. And he said, "Okay, kid, what's the next step?" I said, "Well, Tomorrow morning, I have to get a trailer hitch put on my Camaro Z28 so that I can rent a U-Haul so that I can go get my dirt bike out of storage and drag it with us to Clarksville, Tennessee, Fort Campbell, Kentucky. He's like, what? <laughs> and then all that happened the next day. And he definitely wasn't happy about it. And we, he drove me to Fort Campbell and then he got on a plane and flew back home to Connecticut and I was... I was alone and unafraid. I was now I was now a lieutenant in a unit, Ranger qualified in the 101st Airborne Division. Pretty cool thing. Pretty cool place to be. And what were your duties at Fort Campbell School Street? Was it more training, or you were actually going to? No. So now I'm in a unit. Uh, I signed into the uh, to the first brigade of the 101st Airborne Division, which its lineage was the 327th Infantry Regiment. Um, yeah, the 327th uh, had a history that reached back through Vietnam uh, and back to World War II. In World War II, it was actually a glider regiment. The gliders, uh, it was the 401st Glider Regiment, and then it transitioned to the 327th Infantry Regiment. So that was my unit. I was in 3rd Battalion of the 327th Infantry at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And the cool thing about showing up there was although it had been a good number of years, unlike a lot of other young lieutenants showing up there for the first time, I knew my way around. I knew where my old neighborhood was. I knew where the hospital was. I knew where the PX was. So, you know, it was kind of like going back home again. Um, yeah, it, early February. And uh, as with all good stories, army stories, war stories, no shit there I was, right? Um the weekend that I arrived at Fort Campbell in early February, they had a freak snow ice storm. And, you know, in the Southeast, they're not well prepared for even the slightest problem like that, just snow plows and sand and all that kind of thing. So uh, cars were sliding and falling off the road all over the place. I'm, I'm a quasi New England kid. I can kind of get around. But they actually shut the post down. They shut the post down. But I had already signed in on the Friday, just to sign in, just to, you know, get in. Did you live on base? I lived off post in an apartment uh, where a lot of my other lieutenant buddies lived. And you just reminded me of a story that I don't know that I'm going to tell. <laughs> and uh, uh, just, you know, because you want to sign in off leave so that you're officially off leave and you're saving your leave and you can figure out all the rest later. So uh, I in processed on the Friday just enough to, to get my CIF, my TA-50, my gear, 
So I've got my gear, but it's it's not organized. I haven't put anything together. It's just in duffel bags. It's at my house, in my apartment. And I've met my company commander, so I know who he is. And I know that the unit is getting ready to go to the field on Monday, actually. Um, but no one's really given me any guidance about what to do next. You know, this is my first foray with my new unit. And what I know is I am the f f uh, fifth lieutenant in the company. All three of the rifle platoons have a platoon leader, and the company XO position is also filled, but they've assigned me to this company, Charlie Company, 3rd of the 327th. So I'm just thinking, okay, well... There's some stipulation in something that I read that says I've got five days to in process. So I'm probably on my own for the next five days, you know, going here, going there, checking in, doing whatever. And and so I'm good. On Sunday, the, the, the snowstorm hits, the post closes down, and my company commander calls me and says, Hey, you've got your gear, right? And I said, Yes, sir. He said, All right, well you're coming to the field with us anyway. Now, I just got out of ranger school. I'm chilled to the bone for the next six weeks. It, it, I could have been in Florida, and I'd still be chilled to the bone because you, you come out of winter ranger school, it, there's there's an extra layer of pride that goes with winter ranger. They, you sew your thread on, your tab on with white thread, and you think you're tougher than the rest. It's a bunch of baloney. But anyway, I'm a winter ranger, but I'm cold. And now they're going to the field in the winter? I don't know, already? <laughs> I just got here, and my and my gear is not configured. So he says, "Be at the orderly room tomorrow morning." So boom, that night, two days after sign, two three days after signing into Fort Campbell, that night I'm out in the snow at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, in the field, and I'm thinking to myself, "What in the world had just happened?" I didn't. Even, I haven't even fully in process to the installation. <laughs> So the idea was that I would mirror one of the other platoon leaders throughout that field problem and just kind of get, you know, cut my teeth and see how things operate in life. So it was okay. It was okay from that standpoint. The other thing that was okay about it is you eat a hell of a lot better in the field when you're not in ranger school than when you're in ranger school. And, and I'll never forget it. Um, they had a warming tent set up. Because, you know, this is, now this is an infantry unit. I mean, there's not, people don't sleep in tents in an infantry unit. <laughs> you sleep on the ground, under your poncho, under your poncho. Yeah, you, you make a little hooch for yourself, 6 to 12 inches off the ground, canted so that precipitation runs off. You lay out your polypro mat, and you put your sleeping bag down if it's come to you even, or you just roll up in your poncho liner. That's it. And, 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 and you know... I knew that this is what I wanted. This is who I wanted to be. Just not three days after graduating from ranger school, right? So anyway, they have a warming tent, and they bring hot soup and coffee in on a deuce and a half at like 10 or 11 at night for the night patrol guys to be able to get something to warm up when they come back in. So I come back in off this patrol with the, with the platoon leader whose platoon I'm ultimately going to take about two weeks later, three weeks later, whatever it was. And we get back to the command company command post where this warming tent and this soup and coffee is, and all the soldiers just dissipate. They go to their they go to their hooch. They go to their little. I'm time to get some rack. I'm standing there. I'm an emaciated ranger. So I'm like, there's a whole tin of soup in that tent. So I went in the tent and I sat and ate soup all night with the combo sergeant. <laughs> I was like, this is a, this is heaven. <laughs> Oh my goodness! And heard stories about the real army all night from the combo sergeant. So, um, and then you know, and then off we go. There I am. Um, I'm at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and we come out of the field. I finish my in processing that I should have finished before I went to the field. And uh, the very, very next thing they do is they send me to air assault school. The rappel out of a helicopter and over walls and stuff. And that's right there at, at Fort Campbell. It's right there at Fort Campbell. It used to be the only place that they had a, an air assault school. They do them in a number of places now. How long is the air assault school? Uh, 10 days. It has It has been, it, you know how every product you buy in the store says new or improved or better than? Okay. So, you know, every school wants to claim it's the biggest, baddest, coolest, hardest school in the Army. But the air assault school had a tagline, the 10 toughest days in the Army. Now, 10 days, yeah. 
Now I had just come out of ranger school, so I wasn't buying the tagline, right? <laughs> and and I'm a pompous lieutenant who's full of himself, right? So <clears throat> I get up on the 30-foot rappel tower. Wait, let me tell you a story going into ranger school first. <laughs> okay, so uh, company first sergeant, God, I have too many stories. Company first sergeant says to me, uh, hey, sir, company commander tells me we got to get you a PT test because you're going you're, you're going to sign into air assault school next Monday. This is like a week after out, out of the field. It's boom, boom, boom. I love it, though. I mean, it's, it's what I signed up for. So, you know, again, <clears throat> I was in premier shape going into ranger school. I'm a little emaciated coming out, but I'm still standing and I'm still in decent shape. So PT test doesn't, you know, whatever. Fine. Like two minutes of push-ups, two minutes of sit-ups, two mile run. I got this. No big deal. <clears throat> so he says, all right, Monday, or let's go to PT test because Monday you're signing to air assault school. Roger that first, sir. So we get out on the road, and I know exactly where I am because I've been up and down this road before as a kid in the back seat of the Ford Grand Torino family car, right? And first sergeant said, "Is the, I think the word is impetuous. I think I was probably an impetuous second lieutenant. First sergeant says to me, all right, sir, you're going to run down the road. There's a stop sign down there. I need you to turn around, stop sign, and come back. Do it twice, and or that'll be your two-mile run. Like, first sergeant, I got this. I used to live here. I know exactly what you're talking about. Well, I should, probably should have paid closer attention because, yes, I lived there as a kid, but that was 13 years ago. So I'm running, and I'm running, and I'm running. And I'm like, mm, I think I passed the stop sign he was talking about. Turn around, because I feel like I better turn around, and I come back, and, uh, you know, I still passed the two-mile run, but I didn't turn around at the right point. I went further than I had to. Luckily, I was in good shape and was running okay anyway. So my time was good enough to get into air assault school. But that was, you know, that was like lesson number three about, hey, Lieutenant, don't be too full of yourself, right? Okay, I got one more of those for you. So now I'm in air assault school. And I'm up on the 30-foot rappel tower, which is one of the main, you know, graduation requirements you got to Repel with your combat gear, do an Australian repel, which is a face first repel. Um, you gotta do a few different repels. So I'm up there doing, getting ready to do the Australian repel, the face first descent. And um, so I'm standing on the edge of the thing, and the tension goes from the rope in, in the small of your back back to the anchor point. So when you lean over the edge, there's no slack. It's full tension in the rope from the anchor point to the small of your back. And then you belay yourself by letting the rope off of your chest and you slide down the rope. So I step up there and the air assault instructor, Staff Sergeant Way Myers, W-A-Y-M-E-Y-E-R-S, never forget him. <laughs> tough, tough black NCO looks at me and says, hey, sir, I see you've got that ranger tab on your shoulder. I said, Roger that, sorry. He says, you probably you probably think you're pretty bad. You've done this before, haven't you? And I said, Roger that, Sergeant. I was all full on you. Roger that, Sergeant. He's like, okay. <laughs> what I didn't know was happening at the time, but I heard this bloomp, bloomp. He was dropping slack in my rope on the deck, on the top deck. And then he was holding me. So it felt like there was tension from me to the anchor point, but there was slack coiled up on the deck. And the way they tell you to start an Australian rappel is they say, lean, 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 go. Lean, 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 go. And then that's when you start to descend. So he's saying, lean, 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 go. But he's saying, lean, lean, lean. Because he is hold himself, he's holding me up. And he's teaching me a lesson because I'm being a, you know, Lieutenant, lean, lean, lean. And then when he says go, he lets go of the rope. And all that slack, I just fell halfway down. Now what they teach your belay man, the belay man is the guy at the, at the ground, on the ground level looking up at you. He can always put tension in the rope and it slows your descent, no matter what kind of rappel you're doing. So my belay man, what they teach the belay man is, is if you hear 
someone say falling, or if you think someone is falling, immediately pull all the slack out of the rope. It tightens the rope and it stops the descent of the repeller. Well, I'm not falling because I'm not falling, but there's all that slack that's got to get taken out before I stop falling, right? But my belay man thinks I'm actually falling. So now that Staff Sergeant Waymire has let go of the rope and is probably up there chuckling to himself, now my belay man is freaking out because this young specialist is afraid that I'm about, I'm about to die and he's not going to let it happen on his watch. So he, boom, pulls on the rope. All the slack comes out of the rope, it's full tension, and I go head down, face first, into the wall, boom, bounce off the wall. Did you get hurt? And no, it, no. Well, you know, honestly, it wasn't really scary. It was kind of funny, you know. <laughs> this is the way it all happened, and uh, and he let me down, and that was the end of that. And staff sergeant way Mars, you know, he sort of got you. And I'm like, yeah, okay. Fast forward two years, new squad leader shows up in my company. I'm a company executive officer. It's staff sergeant way Mars, and now I'm in charge of him. <laughs> We became very good friends. But that's, you know, that's just kind of the way the Army works sometimes. Wow. Yeah, cool stuff. So I assume you passed your 10 day assault school? I did, yep. So now I'm airborne qualified, air assault qualified, and ranger qualified in the 101st Airborne Division. And that's kind of, you know, when you're graduating from your. ROTC program or your West Point program or your OCS program, that's, you've arrived. I now I'm a, I'm a rifle platoon leader of 30 young men in a high speed, cool unit with rich tradition and history. And I've done all the right badge things. And here I am. How long did you stay a platoon leader at Fort Campbell? Uh, four, 14 or 15, 15 months. Uh, and then I became a company executive officer for about a year. And then still I at Fort Campbell. still at Fort Campbell. And then I became uh, a platoon leader again for another what be, what ended up becoming two years because this pesky thing called the Gulf War kicked in. And that's we we uh, uh, a, another full circle story. So. Uh, I'm in the 101st, and we are on rotation to go to West Point, New York, and train the new cadets. When was this? In 1990. 1990? 1990. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> in March of 1990, we did a site survey, went up to West Point to learn what our requirements were going to be. And you see how this is full circle, because that's who trained me when I was a cadet. So I know what's going on. I get it. I know where we're going to be and how it's going to go. Um, and then we actually, I was the support platoon leader. <clears throat> so that meant that I was responsible for the logistics of our 600 man battalion. I had to get us and our stuff and our trucks and our aerial resupply kits from point A to point B and make sure everybody had everything that they needed to have. What that usually ends up meaning is that you go on the advon and the rear von. In other words, if there, if it's a 90 day deployment, yours is 120 days because you're 15 days ahead of it and 15 days after it. So my platoon sergeant at the time and I literally drove in his Chevy van from Fort Campbell, Kentucky. We did a, we did a POV uh, deployment just for the two of us to get up there, get keys to everything, to get everything set up. The two of us went up there in late May of 1990 and we would have been there June, July, August, 120 days. We would have wrapped it up in, uh, at the end of August of 1990, but here's what went down. <laughs> it was the 2nd of August, 1990. Um, hang on. I gotta make sure I, I'm in the right place at the right Time. Where was I? What were we doing? Okay. So I told you I played <clears throat> I played rugby at West Point. Um, 
I kept playing rugby after West Point. I played on the Fort Campbell team and I got selected to the all army rugby team. So like the, you know, 15 best rugby players in the army Marines have a team coast guard has a team. So it was convenient that while we were training at West Point that summer, the Saranac Lake rugby tournament was just up the road from West Point, a couple hours up, up in the Adirondacks, the Can-Am rugby tournament. It's one of the premier rugby tournaments that happens in uh, Northern America. So our all army rugby team was an entrant. So I went up there and played rugby. I got a phone call on my cell phone, right? A big space-sized cell phone that said, uh, hey, you need to get back down here to West Point. Some things are changing in our mission here at West Point for the summer. So I packed up, tournament was over anyway, drove back. And this guy named Saddam Hussein had invaded Kuwait. And everyone's gathered around the little TV that we had in our command post, and they're watching it. <laughs> I'll never forget the day. It was a it was a couple of days into it. Uh, in fact, I kept the t-shirt from the rugby tournament for the longest time because it said August 2nd, 1990. I, I don't have it anymore. I kept it till like like last year, you know, holes in it and everything else. Anyway, because it marked this time in life, right? When my rugby career kind of got put on <laughs> got put on hold. <clears throat> um we're sitting around the TV, we're looking at it, and, and what we did, what every unit that goes to West Point to, to logistically support the cadets and train the cadets, they augment staff that's actually resident at West Point. There are some, the, the professors in the summertime will also become instructors and all those kinds of things. So the unit augments it. So next to my desk, I had a <clears throat> United States Corps of Cadets West Point uh, logistician. Captain Janet Richardson was her name. Never seen her since, but she was sort of in charge, and I did all her bidding. I, I, I made things happen. She told me what to do. I made things happen. I remember us looking at the TV, looking at Captain Richardson, and, and I said to her, ma'am, we're going to be out of here in about a week. And she said, oh, that'll never happen. Because, you know, oh, this is West Point, and we've got to train the cadets. And I was like, no, you understand. I'm in the 101st Airborne Division. We're an 18-hour deployment part of the 18th Airborne Corps. Did you immediately, when you heard about Saddam, realize that's what was going to happen? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you're ready for it. When you're in... When you're in what was <clears throat> going through your head when you heard that? Well, when you're in the, when you're in the 18th Airborne Corps, uh, you conduct EDRIs pretty regularly. Emergency Deployment Readiness Exercises. That Back in the late 80s, that's what we called them. I don't know what they do now, what they call them. So you literally, uh, you know, lived your life with a bag packed and knew that if the phone rang and they said Eagle Anvil, that no, nothing else was required. You were going to head into the orderly room, draw your weapon and get on the bus or the truck to the airfield to go to wherever you were going to go. That's just the life that you lived when you're in the, the 101st, 82nd or the 10th Mountain Division of the, 100, of the 18th Airborne Corps. So you just knew. So as I, I looked at her, I said, man, we're going to be out of here. And he's like, oh, that'll never happen. <clears throat> Four days later, line haul vehicles were showing up at West Point to get all of our stuff to take us all the way back to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, so that we could deploy to the Persian Gulf. And it was high adventure because um, we had to move this entire battalion and its equipment from West Point back to Fort Campbell from Fort Campbell to Jacksonville to the port to then go to Duran in Saudi Arabia where we landed. So I, I mean, I could relive all those days for you, but from, you know, on or about the 5th of August until the end of August, we were just on fire moving. So I, myself and the battalion XO, who was a major, we, we were so strung out trying to get everything done. We drove deuce and a halves down to the railhead. We, officers, number one, officers shouldn't be doing that. Number two, majors definitely shouldn't be driving deuce and halves. I was a lieutenant at this time. And we're driving the deuce and halves down to the railhead to get them loaded up on the trip rail cars to rail car them down to Jacksonville to get on a boat to go across the, the ocean. It was, <laughs> it was crazy, but we were uber, we were super, super focused. I mean, this, we're going to war. 
and we were we were what were you thinking you know, you know for sure you guys oh we know going. we're we know we're going and and if and were you a platoon leader i was i was so i was the taking a bunch of your guys yeah uh i was the uh support platoon leader so we had uh we had uh um 20 i had about 25 guys seven trucks, a couple of motorcycles, a whole bunch of aerial resupply stuff, cargo nets and bladders and blivets to move us in the air on helicopters wherever we had to go. Did you know where you were going? Uh, no. I think the only thing we knew in those early days was we were going to land at or end up at King Fod International Airport. That's where we ended up. That's where, that's where Camp Eagle was established in 1990 uh, on a big limestone bed, all kinds of hodge tents, like the tents that they give people when they do the trek to the Mecca, the hodge, the pilgrimage. We, we all lived in big hodge tents on this limestone bed uh, from the day we arrived until... What day did you arrive? <sighs> it's a good question. I've got a book. I'll, I'll share it with you. Uh, where I counted down the days, and I've never, I've never lived my life that way. I'm not a day counter or a countdowner or any of that kind of stuff. But for whatever reason, the day we landed, I said to myself, "All right, I'm going to write 210, 210 in the front of this notebook, and I'm going to count it down." Why you knew you had 210 days? No idea. I chose it. No idea. Ended up being right, plus or minus about 10 days. Uh, so I got there. I got there. What I was think. Your first uh, it was hot. Um, it, it, I think the two impressions were it was extremely hot and we were extremely mission focused. You know what I mean? I mean, this is what we trained for. This was, we we're, we're going to do it. We're going to do the thing we trained to do. What were you expecting to happen? Did you think we'd be in all war? Yeah. You the, think it, it was going to be an in and out. You had no clue. I had no clue. But the indications were, well, I, okay, so I'll do a flashback for you. And then I think, yeah. So the flashback is this. When I signed into Fort Campbell, Kentucky, back in that February of 1988, within about a month, they, as part of the in-processing, after I finished that field problem that I shouldn't have gone on in air assault school, then I actually in-processed. And one of the things they did was they, they took new officers that had signed into the SCIF the secure compartmentalized intelligence facility, the SCIF. And they briefed us on O-Plan 5027. 5027 was battle in the Middle East. I mean, it was, you know, it was on the shelves. Everyone knew that at some point in time, somewhere along the way, we might have to go to war in the Middle East. That, 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 nothing secret about that in general terms. But it described the operational plan that was on the shelf. And I'll never forget this. <laughs> Brand new lieutenant. I'm in the 101st Airborne Division. It's all very exciting. They're briefing the war plan and they say the following words. I'm not making this up. <clears throat> At this point, the 101st Airborne Division will be consolidated and reorganized into a brigade sized element. You said, What? <laughs> Are you telling me that the three brigades have been decimated so bad that there's only a brigade left? I, that's what I remember from that briefing. So this is to answer your question about that. I think it was going to be a quick trip. No, because I had that in the back of my mind. And then I had in the front of my mind everything that anybody read or heard on CNN and in the papers in those days, which is we thought there were going to be 100,000 U.S. casualties in that. Or I think I just overread 10,000. I think the, the estimates were. Now it's escaping me, but there were a lot of zeros in it. it we thought this was going to be a high end conflict with a lot of casualties. So we all thought we were going into to the real deal and it was going to last a long time and all that. None of us expected it to to go down the way that it did. 